Hi, everyone, and welcome to Tin Capsules, where we take a look back at Fort Wayne's minor league baseball history. I'm John Nolan, and today I'm joined by LaTroy Hawkins, a member of the inaugural 1993 Fort Wayne Wizards. He then would go on to become the first player in franchise history to make the big leagues, and he stayed there a while. 21 seasons. Unbelievable longevity. Finished top 10 in Major League Baseball history for appearances as a pitcher. And Latroy, congrats on all that success since you pitched here in Fort Wayne. Thanks so much for your time and for reminiscing with us. Let's go back to 1993. What were your first impressions of Fort Wayne? Uh, my first impressions of Fort Wayne was <clears throat> we got off the bus. We flew in from Fort Myers, Florida, and it was still snow on the ground. And the stadium wasn't ready yet. And I think we started that year maybe on a 12, 13 day road trip. And when we got off the road trip, the stadium was finally finished. And it was pretty cool. It was just a little different. Like, whoa, are they going to be ready with all this snow in time to, um, for us to play our home opener? And when we got back off the road, everything was perfect. Everything was perfect. Yeah, right here we see a look at that very first game at Memorial Stadium. Now, you weren't the starting pitcher in that one, but I know you did begin that season in the team starting rotation. To jump ahead to the end, we can share that LaTroy finished that season as the triple crown winner of the Midwest League, meaning that he was first in ERA, strikeouts, and wins. Set a number of records that still stand as franchise records all these years later. But, LaTroy, tell us the journey of that season. How, did, how would you sum it up? Looking at that video, I remember, I think, Ramon Valletti hit the first home run at Memorial Stadium for a, a Wizards player, if I'm not correct. And I remember him saying on TV, Ramon Valletti. Um, but that season started off not so good for myself. I was actually in the rotation, didn't pitch well, um, was sent to the bullpen to pitch out a, a long relief. And uh, one night, Andy McPhail, who was our GM of the Minnesota Twins at the time, he was in town uh, coming to watch the affiliate. And I, he, I came in the game and I, I pitched pretty good, I guess, over two, three innings. I had pitched so bad, I thought I was going back to Elizabeth. I thought I was going to get demoted to go to our short season A-ball team. Well, after Andy McPhail saw me pitch that night, he called me in the office. Called, usually when you get called in the office, good chance you're going up or you're going down. And I knew I hadn't pitched well enough to go up. So I figured out what they were going to let me know. I was headed back to, I was headed to Elizabeth. Well, Andy sits me down and, you know, our pitching coach is there and our, our manager, Jim Dwyer. And Andy goes on to say that Latroy is to pitch every fifth day for the rest of the season. I don't care how, you know, how he pitches. He's going to pitch every fifth day. <laughs> and I'm like, the first thing I'm thinking, like, whoa, I'm not going back to Elizabeth in Tennessee. I'm going to get a chance to pitch. I'm staying for Wayne. He's like, okay. And after that, um, <clears throat> I don't know what clicked for me, but, you know, as you can tell, as you know, I went on a nice little streak and I got hot and I stayed hot the whole season. And um, it was probably one, of, it was definitely my best season I had in professional baseball. And, and I think being so young, being able to finally, you know, have some kind of breakthrough was, you know, very rewarding for myself. You were 20 years old that season. The Twins had drafted you out of high school in Gary, Indiana, a couple years prior. As you see the video here of yourself back then, what was the scouting report on you at that point? Uh, I think the scouting report had to be that he had really good command of his fastball, and which means I could throw wherever, wherever I wanted to. I really don't think I threw my slider for a strike much, but you know, at that level, um, young guys are swinging at a lot of everything. And I think I use that to the best of my ability and, and expose the guys with by throwing breaking balls outside of the zone and being able to throw my fastball where I want it in any count. And when you see yourself there, do you think you kept most of those same mechanics all the way through your career or does anything stand out as being a noticeable difference from where you ended up? You know what? It looks like it looks the same way I did when I retired in 2015. Kind of cool. But I always wanted to make sure my mechanics was not – I always wanted to make sure I looked like I was playing catch. I never wanted to make it look like I was, I was out there laboring and trying to throw hard. Uh, I think I found out early on, probably in 92, the harder that I tried to throw, the softer I threw. 
So I figured to see how hard I can throw when I'm at my most relaxed state. And that pretty much worked out for me. It kept me, uh, definitely kept me from going under the knife too many times. I was only, only one under the knife one time in my career, and that was in 2010. So I would definitely attribute that to my easy mechanics and my thought process of playing catch with my catcher and not ever overthrowing. Yeah, and you kept it in great shape, I know. I mean, it's kind of a running joke that you look like you could still go out on the mound right now and, and get batters out. Uh, we saw along the way here a photo of a scouting report that Baseball America had for you from 1994 because after the season you had here in Fort Wayne, that made you a, a top twins prospect, a top 100 caliber prospect in all of baseball. I think it did describe you there as gangly. Uh, I said that, you know, you probably would add some strength over the years and that would increase your fastball velocity. And uh, it looks like uh, that's exactly what happened, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, they pretty much hit it on the nose. Um, they said it, I mean, <laughs> When I was in high school, my, my fastball was 82 to 84, and I believe that. You know, here's some scouts now. Say, oh, he was throwing 90 in high school. No, I was definitely a draft pick that I was projected to throw hard. Uh, I was projected to fill into my frame because I graduated from high school at like 6'2", maybe 170 pounds, throwing 82 to 84 miles an hour. And the Twins did a great job of, you know, doing their scouting and projecting where I would finish up at. And... A lot of times, you know, scouts get it wrong, and, you know, a lot of times they get it right, and they got it right. Yeah, and, and the Twins got quite a bit right back then, not only with yourself, but also featured on that page with someone like Tory Hunter. Um, and I know, obviously, you guys went on to, to have some really good years there with the Twins, and I know you still have connections to a number of those teammates in Fort Wayne overall. Yeah, well, Tory was the year. I think Tory was the year after me. I was there in 93. But Matt Lawton was on the team with me in, in Fort Wayne. And uh, I was just texting with Matty Lawton yesterday. Um, who else was on the team? Anthony Bird. I, I made a post on Facebook and he commented. You know, I still call, talk to uh, Ken Turpek, or Turpy, our first baseman that year. So there was a couple. Uh, Scott Moden, who actually started that game, the first game in Memorial Stadium. Scott is a police officer, a sheriff department or something in, in Orange County. I think he's even probably SWAT now. But, you know, a lot of guys that went on to do some things. Sean Miller, who was a pitcher. He still lives in Fort Wayne. Um, hadn't talked to Dan Serafini in a while, but he has a bar in, I think, Reno, Nevada. So there's a lot of guys that went on to do great things. Yeah, and you're right. Torrey was here in 94, and Ben Jones was another guy who was on that <laughs> second edition of uh, the Wizards back then. And I know through your connection uh, – in part there with Ben, that actually brought you back to Fort Wayne in 2016. That was the first year uh, of your retirement after that 21-year career in the big leagues. And so you can fill in the details here, but I know you're here for a graduation party, and so it conflicted with catching a Tin Caps game, but you did have a chance to get a, a quick tour of Parkview Fields. Yeah, it was. Um, we were there for Ben's, Ben Jones, his daughter, uh, his middle daughter is my goddaughter, and she was graduating from high school. And I actually was not working for the first time in her life, and I was able to attend her graduation. And that's why I looked – and the other guy in the picture was Luke Torrey Hunter. And Torrey was at Notre Dame playing football, and he spent a lot of time at Ben's house um, with, with his family and my daughter, uh, who was also in there. Just had a chance to, to go back to pretty much where it all started at. And you see in the clip, I had a chance. They were playing against the Padres, and one of my old teammates, Mark Pryor, was was in town, so we had a chance to chit chat with him. But it was a good time to you know be able to show my daughter where you know I played at, um, where I started, where you know my first bit of success in professional baseball, and my wife, and the young lady to the far left in the red. That's actually Matt Lawton's daughter, who's my goddaughter also. <laughs> so you know. Those guys that I played with in Fort Wayne or was close in age with, we're all still really tight. Tory lives probably a half a mile from me here in Dallas. Um, and we all try to get together as much as possible, but we don't see each other, but we for sure talk a lot. And it's actually funny because I was just on a FaceTime call with Ben Jones this afternoon, chit-chatting to him about some baseball and, and good things because he's a scout for the Cincinnati Reds. And I started this um, next Saturday, ne next Thursday, I'm doing a Zoom with, Indiana high school coaches and some of the Indiana um, college coaches. 
and I'm going to try to bring on somebody specific in baseball to talk with them. And Ben's going to be on the first edition next Thursday because we're going to start at the bottom. Well, we're going to start where, you know, it all starts at with the scouting. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And sounds like a great idea. Best of luck uh, as you execute that going forward. I know, as you touched upon, in in 93, the first year of the Wizards, that meant a brand-new ballpark, and it was the nicest field you'd played in at the time. But you look ahead in history, and now with Parkview Field, uh, how would you compare the facilities or compare just the the evolution of minor league baseball over the years? They were definitely comparable, considering the time. One was in 93, and this was in 2016. I mean, they were, you know, because in 93, Memorial Stadium was the latest, greatest thing. It was – I, I can tell you this, I didn't hear what, not one visiting team complain about that brand new stadium. It was, it was really cool. And where it, was, where it was located right there by the Coliseum and, you know, had the, the, the river was down, you know, in the back of it. I mean, it was just a, a great spot. And, you know, a lot of the guys, we lived pretty close, so it didn't have to drive too far to get there. But it's funny, I don't think I've ever went to downtown Fort Wayne when I played there in 1993. <laughs> Yeah, you probably weren't alone at that point in time, but things are uh, a bit different now since Parkview Field was built. And so all in all, I know between the success that you had on the mound, the fact that you were back in your home state, a lot of great memories from your time in Fort Wayne. But here we can take a look back. Uh, one of those newspaper clippings featured uh, something of a player profile in the new Sentinel newspaper in which you were surveyed on some questions. And you did have at least one complaint about Fort Wayne. Uh, I think it, the line was that, there weren't enough clubs for a youngster like yourself under the age of 21 uh, to go out in. So I'm sorry to, to hear that. I exactly. think you can have a better time here in, uh, in Fort Wayne these days. That's so funny because I, um, I couldn't go out because I wasn't old enough, but I had a, um, <clears throat> I had a fake ID with um, my, my, actually my uncle's three and a half, four years, four years older than I am. I had his, it was a real Indiana ID, but it had my face and all his information. And I was trying to get in the club one night early on, and I had just pitched on television. And the guy at the front door noticed me from watching the game on television. He said, you're not so-and-so. You're the Troy Hawkins. And he took my ID, and I was so mad at him. I was so upset. Oh, man, the cost of being Fort Wayne famous. But glad that the, glad that the paper at least had it right there dubbing you a family man. And I you know you certainly lived up to that uh, over the course of your career. Um, going back to your visit here to Parkview Field, one thing that the ballpark doesn't have at this point in time is any kind of a, a Hall of Fame. But some years ago, the franchise did recognize you in the next best way possible, or maybe even the best way possible, and having a bobblehead for you. Uh, what did that honor mean to you? Oh, that's pretty cool. They can do a bobblehead of you. I mean, I never had one in the big leagues, but at least I can say one of the affiliates that I, um, I, I did pretty well that thought enough of me to have one created. Um, but like you said, I guess, you know, I guess that comes with being the first, you know, the first, first big leaguer to come out of, you know, the Fort Wayne affiliate. Um, and that was the way they honored me. I thought that was pretty cool. Absolutely. Now, not counting the one, uh, bouncer who didn't let you in, uh, what message would you have to, uh, Fort Wayne fans, uh, from the past and present? Um, <clears throat> I would like to just tell, tell the fans to keep supporting the tin caps just keep support and go out there. I mean, it's a, it's a great, incredible, fun atmosphere. It's a family atmosphere. And, you know, if you want your kid to, to learn to love the game, take them out to the ballpark and let them watch the game. And, that, and that's how you can do it. But continue to, to support your minor league teams, especially the ones that are in your city. Go out and support. It's a great time. And get to know these young superstars and these really good players before they make it to the big leagues. And, you know, you have a, you have your kids and, and yourself have a somebody that you can watch and watch them grow from a rookie, you know, to a guy that's arbitration eligible, then to a guy that's that's ready for free agency, and then you can get them, you know, watch them retire in the game. Well said, and Latroy, as you you shifted your position there for a moment, we can see the artwork behind you. Looks like a pretty cool, multiple photos there of of Michael Jordan, MJ. And so, and cool jersey as well. I see Barry Larkin there too. So after your phenomenal season in Fort Wayne in 93, you jumped to double A in 1994, pitching in Nashville. 
Now, of course, 1994, the Southern League also featured Michael Jordan playing for the White Sox AA affiliate, the Birmingham Barons. And I know you got a chance to, to face him, especially for you growing up near Chicago. Tell us, what was that like? You know what? It was, it was, it was a little kid's dream come true, being able to um, compete on the same field with my, my basketball idol. Actually, in my sport, like you said, growing up in Gary, I was 35 minutes from Chicago Stadium. And I have to tell you, I was one of those kids that wanted to be like Mike. And to get a chance to actually compete against him, get to know him, um, and even tell all my friends that I got a chance to meet Jordan and get to know Jordan. You know, it's just talking about it now, it's like it's one of the coolest things I've ever done, being able to, you know, compete, face him, compete against him, and to get to know him. Yeah, and how did it go when you pitched against him? You know what, I think I gave up – the first time I think he – at some point he got a base hit off of me because I remember I picked him off first base. Um, I got inter- to interrupt you. What was the thought process of picking off your legend? You couldn't, couldn't let him just hang out there for, for a second? Well, well, I had already told him when I first met him a couple, uh, a couple days before – that my mom told me to throw him all fastballs. He was like, really? Tell your mom I love you. I love her. I was like, okay. So I threw him all fastballs. I mean, I didn't, wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but I didn't think he was going to try to steal second base on the first pitch. So I just, you know, I just threw over there to check on him. But I gave him my best move and I was able to pick him off. And there you have it. There's some video, there's some footage out there of me facing him. Wow. Yeah, he had 30 stolen bases that year, but thanks to you, couldn't get that 31. No, not at all. Uh-uh. I gave I, I contributed to his bad average, not his stolen base percentage. And you did strike him out at one point, right? Yes, I think I punched him out two or three times. Probably faced him four or five times. I mean, it was – uh, he grounded out the third base, I remember, one time. One time he grounded out the second base. But, you know, it was just – it's one of those situations where I was, every time I faced him, I was just in awe because he was the greatest basketball player to ever live at that time and now. And for me to be able to be wanting to be like Mike and getting a chance to meet Mike, you know, I just, yeah, I can't say anymore. I'm in, I'm in heaven. You know, I have a, you know, I have a, a game room where I got pictures on the wall and jerseys. And like you said, like you see, I can see this was my favorite poster growing up. My favorite poster, my favorite poster. I always wanted to be able to do that, but I couldn't, couldn't palm a ball. And it was one of the first things I got when I, when I built my house was that and a Jordan jersey. I couldn't, I mean, it wouldn't be complete without those two. So every Sunday night, I'm, I don't, I'm not the type, like, I'm, I'll binge watch something before I wait every week to see it. This is the only show that I'm, I'm in front of the television waiting. At 7.50 Central Time, waiting for the last dance to come on. I don't know what I'm going to do after next Sunday because the last two episodes will be going. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually go back and watch it all over again. And then next year I'll watch it again because um, just, you know, hearing a lot of things about Jordan over the years and getting a chance to actually see that a lot of it was true, you know, how he, how he loved to compete, how he pushed his players to the limit. Some, sometimes it's questionable towards, you know, to the fans, but – You know, I think him being a great leader, understanding what it took and what each of his teammates could take and where he could push their buttons and make them better. Yeah, it's been uh, fantastic to watch. And again, you know, you were part of the first dance for minor league baseball in Fort Wayne and uh, could be considered the GOAT of uh, Fort Wayne pitchers over the years with that amazing 1993 season that you had and thanks so much again for reminiscing with us here no problem john always a pleasure to hang out with you and you're always so you know nice and accommodating when i come to town or when you come to our minor league town putting you on the air and keeping in touch over the years so thank you for your friendship yeah our pleasure and uh we hope to have a chance to see you at parkview fields again down the road uh but in the meantime all the best uh, to you and your loved ones same to you stay safe brother There's LaTroy Hawkins joining us here on this edition of Tin Capsules. I'm John Nolan saying thanks for watching. So long.